You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone, and welcome to another fantastic episode of Ask Drone You. This week in drone news, we have quite a lot. And we're here again with Haya Costello from Drone DJ. Welcome back to the show, my friend. Thanks for having me on the show. How are you today? Doing well, doing well. Very excited as there is some news that hasn't even been released yet. There's so much happening in the industry. And it really seems like after the government shutdown uh, has ended that a lot of things are picking up in pace. But how are things going for you, Haya? Well, things are going pretty well here. I mean, we are still not done with the winter in New York, so we got some more snow today, and I think there's more snow coming this weekend. So for drone pilots uh, up in the Northeast, uh, we're waiting for spring to come around. Well, unfortunately, Haya, I have shorts on, so... (laughs) (laughs) Keep it below the table. (laughs) (laughs) It is a balmy 68 degrees here in uh, Albuquerque, so it is a beautiful day. Um, But let's get right into this week's drone news. Why don't you go ahead and start us off, Haya? Yeah, I think this is going to be an interesting one. Uh, This is going to be mostly your story, I think. Uh, Hobbyist drone pilots are now soon to be required to use lens for uh, their flights in controlled airspace. Tell me more about it, Paul. This is actually a story that we broke together as no one has broken this story. And it's really interesting because, you know, Haya, right now we're in a time where hobbyist pilots are kind of in between the old law and the new law. As the FAA reauthorization of 2018 happened at the latter half of last year, the government shutdown kind of stopped any progress on the FAA interpreting those laws and coming out with guidelines to help you know, FISDO officers and federal agents kind of help hobbyists comply with those laws. Now, previously, Haya, hobbyist drone pilots would only have to notify air traffic controlled towers at nearby airports when they wanted to fly in controlled airspace. And as you and I both know, a lot of hobbyists don't even notify. And it's kind of a hard system to follow as, you know, the phone can only ring so many times in a given day at certain airports. So in the FAA reauthorization, specifically in Section 349, the FAA says when it comes to recreational operations of unmanned aircraft in Class B, C, or D airspace or within the lateral boundaries of the surface area of Class Echo airspace designated for an airport, the operator must obtain prior authorization from the administrator or designee before operating and must comply with all airspace restrictions and prohibitions. Now, that's a huge change from notify to prior authorization. And Haya, I asked the question, what other system is in place right now to give operators, whether they're commercial or hobbyists, instantaneous access to controlled airspace and have a system to essentially monitor this? And the only system and infrastructure in place at the moment, it seems like it's Lance. So now it looks like in the near future, hobbyists are going to have to use the same Lance system that Part 107 pilots are using in order to gain access to the airspace. Yeah, and that ties, uh, of course, nicely into the article we posted earlier this week about Kitty Hawk uh, going to develop and run basically the Before You Fly app from the FAA. Yes, in fact, Kitty Hawk has now created this infrastructure with Kitty Hawk Dynamic Airspace inputting that into Before You Fly. And also Kitty Hawk is one of the only Lance approved providers. So it's like, well, wait a minute, if they're Lance approved provider and they're taking over Kitty Hawk, I mean, you can kind of just see how this goes down the line. And we just recorded a show with uh, Josh and John, you know, the founders of Kitty Hawk. And they kind (laughs) of led on that, you know, and if, if you guys haven't heard the show yet, Check it out because John very specifically says, well, Kitty Hawk is great for commercial pilots using Lance and it'll also be great for hobbyists that will have to use Lance, you know, soon. And it was like, well, wait a minute. Like, did he just say that? So make sure you guys listen into that show because he definitely drops a hint and a bomb. You've got to listen carefully and acutely if you want to pick up on these little pieces of information. But frankly, Haya, I think this is how the FAA is going to be able to truly monitor which hobbyist pilots are complying and which aren't. 
it's uh, it's for sure a smart move on their end. And uh, what I understand understood from Josh is that they're looking to implement uh, the new Before You Fly app later this year. So we're not quite sure when it's going to be introduced, I believe, but uh, assume it's going to be still 2019 and we'll be using that same app. True. So as yeah. hobbyist law changes and as the FAA will soon have their interpretation of the reauthorization out, it kind of makes sense for that timeline for Before You Fly. But it also looks like we have a whole lot of other drone news to cover this week. Haya, what do you have? Yeah, there's one story from last weekend, actually. This uh, took place in Long Island, where uh, somebody who got a little uh, trigger happy decided to shoot a drone out of the sky using his shotgun. And he fired his shotgun three times. The drone belonged to Lynn Fordale and Teddy Henn, who are part of the Missing Angels in Long Island. And this is a volunteer organization that helps to locate missing dogs. And they had sent the drone up in the air to to look for this dog that was missing. And meanwhile, you got this guy taking his shotgun out, firing two shots. Uh, The drone operators lost the connection with the drone, so for sure he hit it. And they used the uh, last known GPS location of the drone to find out what happened. And as they walked into that neighborhood, somebody else approached them and said, well, hey, there was this guy who shot your drone out of the air. So then the police got involved. Uh, Now it seems that uh, he's going to be charged with third degree criminal mischief and prohibited use of a weapon. And he's due to appear in court at a later date. So we don't know exactly when this is going to happen. We also don't know if federal authorities are going to follow up on this. And that remains to be seen, I think. So I've heard that rumor that this this case, this particular case, has actually made it to the top of the Department of Transportation, you know, a federal entity. And I think it would be really interesting to see what federal prosecution does come into play as there have been other rumors on the street that DOJ, not DOT, has specifically put out a memo to a lot of its federal agents saying, do not go after people who shoot down drones. Who knows why? Maybe it's a resource allocation issue. Maybe they're focusing on trying to give police officers the ability to do that. But you know what? This really just begs the question, Haya. This guy who shot the drone out and to other guys who've been shooting at drones, it's like, what do you have to hide? Why are you so paranoid? (laughs) <laughs> and why the heck would you shoot a drone out of the sky? <laughs> it's no, it's uh, it's not a smart move for sure. But uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens now. I mean, we've we've reported on other cases in the past where people had shot uh, drones out of the sky, and typically they get in trouble with local police. But we've never seen anything happen on the federal level. So we'll keep an eye out for uh, developments in this case. Which is very interesting because federal law uh, eighteen USC thirty two very specifically says what happens if someone does intentionally uh, destroy an aircraft. So I think Uh, drone pilots all over the United States really want to see federal investigators come after someone who shoots down a drone. And I mean, you talk to anyone who's an IDPA member, if you're not familiar with IDPA, essentially it's a competitive shooting club. Um, They all say, because I've been a part of that club myself, that anyone who discharges a firearm in city limits, especially aiming up at the sky, has absolutely no right to be utilizing a firearm in the first place because they fundamentally don't understand the rules of having a firearm. Yeah, and this federal crime, of course, also is punishable up to 20 years in jail. So if they were to pursue it to that extent, it's uh, yeah, the consequences could be pretty serious. And frankly, I think it would be in everyone's best interest if the feds did come after this guy and set the example because yeah. right now there is nothing online, there is nothing that the federal government has put out to say we are going to enforce against this. And frankly, Haya, I'm really afraid of the day that you know, you're know you going to have a drone pilot who has a concealed carry license and fires back at the, uh, the shooter or the shooter decides oh. to take aim at the pilot. I ask the federal government with the utmost respect, please handle this issue before someone gets hurt. Let's not make the human error that humans have made over hundreds, if not thousands of years by not changing a problem until something significant happens. Let's, uh, yeah. let's hopefully just make the change now. But um, there's good news, though, as there is bad news this week. Is that right? There is, and there's uh, also a lot of news still. So the next one that we can talk about for a bit is um, DJI Geofencing. Uh, They rolled it out, the version 2.0, they rolled it out last year. I think it was late October, early November here in the US. 
Then about two, two and a half weeks ago, they rolled it out to 32 European countries, and this is their geospatial environment online, so Geo 2.0. They've now announced to roll it out to, I think it's a dozen or two dozen um, countries in the Asia Pacific region. So DJI is looking to expand their geofencing 2.0 basically around the world, and uh, by doing this, making uh, airports safer than they were before at least. Well, it's interesting to see that Asia was uh, second to be rolled out uh, from the United States, considering that their market segment is much larger than the United States. Yeah, and I'm not quite sure what the uh, logistics were behind the implementation. I mean, it seems there was a pretty big gap from uh, implementing it here in the U.S. and then moving to Europe. Now Asia follows pretty quickly behind Europe. Um, I think it's a good thing, though. I mean, the the new Geo 2.0 is a three-dimensional uh, system rather than just the old circular boundaries that they set around airports. So it's definitely a step in the right direction, I think. I think it's a, a step in the right direction as well. Now, one thing that we have been seeing in the news is that drones have been really showcasing you know, new uses, their new uses to save lives, but also new uses to essentially hold people accountable and transparent. And as we saw with the oil spill in Canada this week, it seems like drones are once again showcasing the lack of transparency by the government. What's going on in Canada right now? Yeah, that's an interesting story. This was uh, last weekend as well. Uh, there is a train wreckage uh, that's, that happens. Uh, 37 cars derailed, and these were cars carrying crude oil. And a number of these tankers have ruptured or broken, so there's there's a quite a significant oil spill. And the company who's the owner of the train, uh, CN Rail, didn't want to disclose the quantity or the amount of oil that had actually spilled. So what happens next, and this is this is all taking place at uh, Saint Lazare in Western Manitoba in uh, Canada. Uh, what happened next is you had two buddies who have a phantom drone and decided to send the drone up, fly towards the wreckage, and actually record the size of the oil spill. And this was the first footage that was then uh, shared on social media that gave at least people some indication as to how bad this situation was. Um, of course, we still don't know exactly how much or, or how many barrels of oil or gallons of oil this equates to. Um, the one benefit is that it's uh, it's very cold up there right now, so the ground is solid frozen, meaning that the oil cannot actually penetrate the soil, making the cleanup efforts a little easier. But still, it's uh, if you look at the footage and the pictures, it's quite a significant wreckage and quite some oil that, uh, that leaked out there. Yeah, it is significant to say the least, but... It also seems like uh, no one really knew the scope of the damage until these two drone pilots, Curtis and Amon, went out there and said, hey, this is what's really going on. Yeah, it's, um, I think it was a smart move on their end. I mean, there were some people commenting that they weren't allowed to fly in that area. I haven't looked into that into detail. Um, either way, I think it's, uh, it's good that this information was made public. I can't understand how it could be dangerous to fly in that area if they were to have some sort of malfunction and the battery were to spark. Obviously, you would have a significant problem on your hands. But it looks like from the pictures that they were pretty, they were distanced pretty far away from the spill itself. So obviously, if you're a drone pilot out there and you're trying to capture a, a you know news story, just make sure that you take safety protocols because you could end up causing more problems, just like you know we've talked about with search and rescue. If search and rescue isn't done properly, you can actually cost someone their life. So Yeah, and also, I, I don't know how they uh, treat a wreckage like this. If they make this an emergency situation with first responders on hand, then you probably wouldn't be allowed to fly there anyway, just like here in the U.S. So it may be a situation of that as well. Um, I'm not quite sure what the details are, when exactly they, this was uh, recorded, but I can imagine that that uh, comes into play also. Absolutely fascinating. So um, it also seems like there are some upcoming events that are going on. Yeah. It looks like one has finally been rescheduled that we have been anticipating. What's going on? The FAA UAS Symposium, uh, originally scheduled to take place earlier this year. Of course, we had the government shutdown, so that's got delayed or postponed. Now it's rescheduled. It's going to be in Baltimore, Maryland, June 3rd through 5th. Um, it's going to be the symposium. We're looking to go. I know, I think you're going as well, right? I will definitely be there. I think it is yeah. one of the most important meetings of the whole year. So, Yeah, last year we had, uh, I remember there was quite a bit of snow and I wasn't able to make it down there. And then when all the news came out, I uh, severely regretted not having gone. 
So uh, it's on my list of places to go to for sure this year. Hopefully we can get some new shows filmed together instead of right thousands of miles apart. So. <laughs> uh, there you go. <laughs> oh, man. I'm excited that the symposium is, uh, is finally going to happen as it is one of the most important events of the year. But for those pilots who like to showcase their work, this is also the weekend of the New York City Drone Film Festival. Tell us about that. Yeah, that's taking place. It's starting actually this afternoon. Um, I think they open the doors at around four o'clock. There's going to be some workshops and sessions and they have an expo as well. Uh, this is all taking place at the Liberty Science Center in New Jersey, which is right across the Hudson River from Manhattan, um, basically right across from uh, the Freedom Tower. They start today, 4 p.m. I'm going to go there tonight. They're showing all these drone videos and drone clips. And last year I was there as well. And they got some, uh, they always have some really amazing footage from people that uh, that's been sent in. So I'm very much looking forward to what they're going to showcase today. Definitely a great place to get some new ideas as a drone pilot to up one's game. I like it. I like it. Oh, yeah. Last year we saw some uh, some videos where they use uh, FPV racing drones with GoPro cameras. And then as people ski or snowboard and jump, the uh, drones fly over the guys in the air. You get these amazing three-dimensional uh, action shots. So uh, we'll see what they have today. Wow. Wow. I know. Well, Peter and I are working on a super high-speed FPV racer that can also carry a very capable camera because we've been seeing this evolution, right, of uh, racers being able to provide, you know, more uh, – how do I say this? They're able to accelerate super fast and maintain that speed. But I yeah. think you can add that with a gimbaled camera and really get some fascinating shots, which will be interesting wow. uh, to see. But it looks like we got one more story when it is concerned to how drones have once again been saving lives. Yeah. But I also think it's important to understand the limitations because as we talk about drones saving lives, we've got to make sure people understand that there are limitations to some yeah. of these aircraft. So, so what happened? What is our weekly boost this week, Haya? Yeah, let's end uh, with a story where drones again have uh, have done something good. Uh, this is the Fremont Police in California. This was earlier in February where a DJI Mavic 2 Enterprise Jewel, so that's with the FLIR camera, was used to find and locate a missing teenager. And this is a teenager. There's talk that he might have had some mental problems or at least some kind of discomfort. He had decided to walk away. And his friends were looking for him, couldn't find him. The police got involved. They sent a drone up. And if you look at the footage, you can see that this particular FLIR camera doesn't provide that much resolution. But the drone operator must have been quite experienced because he picked out the, uh, the, the human body in all the footage uh, fairly quick. And then he used the um, light on the DJI uh, Enterprise or DJI 2 Enterprise to actually direct the police officers to the spot as well. And then the students, the friends who were also involved in uh, locating this missing person uh, had already found the guy. So they were able to bring him back. He wasn't injured or anything. So it wasn't a uh, life threatening situation. But still, drones were used to find this person in the dark uh, relatively quickly. That's awesome. That's such yeah. a powerful. Thing to hear and I love ending this show on a high good news it is always fun well Haya thank you so much for coming on the show once again and, and giving us kind of an yeah. in-depth pulse of the industry really appreciate it thanks for having me on the show man and uh, have a good weekend enjoy the warm weather down there right I am going to try really hard to enjoy this warm weather I'm going to get out and fly some more I've got so much footage I've got to put together it just keeps stacking up on top of me so I'll get to it but Haya thank you again my friend it's always good seeing you Sounds good, man. Appreciate it. And that's going to do it for our show this week, everyone. So thank you again for listening in. Keep those reviews coming in. I really appreciate those last 20 reviews that came in last week. If you love this show, please let us know. Give us a review on Spotify, on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you download the podcast. That is going to do it for this week again. Thank you so much, and thank you for listening to another awesome episode of Ask Drone You. Ask Drone You.